Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is my, uh, what Hannah and Hannah's books refer to as my March of the Penguins, our waddle through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book, author by author, period by period, and I'm not playing favorites on, on this March of the Penguins through 2020. I'm not, I'm treating it exactly as I would if I were doing this multiple books a day as an ordinary library tour. I was originally intending to do that in 2019. If I managed my time a little better, maybe we wouldn't be doing this at all. Instead, uh, instead of playing favorites and just curating this to give you hit after hit after hit, I'm just going through the shelves, just book by book. <laughs> and so it stands to reason that occasionally we will hit a dud. <laughs> and I'm very sorry that random chance brings this dud on a Monday, <laughs> which are already a dud kind of day, and on a, uh, the, the Monday of uh, an international plague. So I know that I'm just uh, bringing coals to Newcastle here, but nevertheless, today's book is about as Plague Monday a book as you could get. <laughs> this is the Penguin Classic Selected Writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. I have no idea why his distinction of being a saint is not on the cover of the book. I it's not an easy thing to do. Not everybody gets to be a saint. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, this is by Ralph McInerney. This is a big, generous uh, collection of selections from Aquinas's writing. Aquinas was a 13th century theologian who wrote voluminously. He was from money. He was from landed aristocracy. He had uh, strained relations with his family, but he had the equivalent of trust funds of his own. He never was in need of... Uh, earning his butter. So he could write all the time, and he did. And uh, he had uh, almost uncontrolled graphomania, so his books are very long and very, very detailed. And uh, he would probably have objected to being called a philosopher. He, he railed against the philosophers of his own day, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, if, I have made no secret on this channel of my contempt for the whole so-called discipline of philosophy, the whole body of writing of philosophy. It is all navel-gazing. It is all tail-chasing. It is all gigantic verbiage castles built on nothing, uh, about nothing, concerning nothing, and designed, written intentionally to be obscure. It's the, it's the biggest, most conclusively enacted version of wordplay that humans have ever done. It is the most quintessentially human genre of writing. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, a theologian is just a philosopher for God. It, 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 that's all they're doing is just they're philosophizing about God. No one has ever seen or could quantify or in any way knows anything about the sunsetness of sun of sunsets. The, the thingness of things. And yet you will find thousand-page philo philosophical tomes on those headings that break them down into a million subheadings. Well, not, not to get too all-encompassingly Monday on you, but no one has ever seen anything that theology is about either. <laughs> no one knows anything about it. It's all just wordplay built upon wordplay built upon wordplay. And the later wordplay acts very sure of itself and sometimes very arrogant, uh, about the earlier wordplay as grounded in fact, merely because it's old. <laughs> but if you examine the earlier wordplay, and 90% of that earlier wordplay when it comes to theology is St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, you'll see that it's built on nothing at all. It's just wordplay. It's just word games. You are better off in, in the modern day if you have the whole philosophy section of a big bookstore or library and, and on, one, on one hand, and on the other hand, you have a minor novel by James Clavell let's say King Rat, you're better off with the novel. And that comes from no fan of fiction at all. You're better off with that one novel and just dump the rest of it. Uh, it's difficult to say this about St. Thomas Aquinas because he's, he's a revered figure. He's, he's, his writings have been cited by millions and millions of people. Their influences on Western philosophy and, and, and Christian theology has been immense. Uh, but you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> this is uh, the uh, the McInerney translation here is quite good. It's quite solid. I got uh, a Saint Thomas Aquinas is not all that difficult to translate. Uh, and uh, so we're just going to delve into uh, the master himself. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you 
I'm going to read you two different sections here from two different works. This, this collection includes lots and lots of, of excerpts from lots and lots of works, including a large amount from the Summa Theologica, which was, is widely regarded as St. Thomas Aquinas' most Aquinian work, even though it's not, it's not technically finished. Uh, but it, it really doesn't matter. My point is it really doesn't matter when you're dealing with uh, a lagoon this murky. <laughs> it really doesn't matter where you put your oar down. Uh, so I'm going to read just a bit. This is a bit from uh, the Summa Contra Gentiles, the, 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 against the Gentiles. Uh, let's see here. We have shown above that there is one first being possessing the full perfection of existence whom we call God and who from the abundance of his perfection grants being to all existing things. He's shown that. We've shown that there is one supreme being and that that being grants being to all other beings. We've shown that. We've demonstrated it. <laughs> we just build from there, is what I'm saying. We just build from there. We, of course, haven't shown that. No one can show that. That is not showable. <laughs> but nevertheless. Uh, thus, not only is he the first of beings, but the principle of all others. He grants existence to other things, not out of any necess necessity of nature, but of his free will, as is clear from the foregoing. The result is that he is the Lord of all things he has made, and for he rules over what is subject to his will. He has perfect dominion over the things produced by him, since in producing them he requires no external agent nor foundation of matter, since he is the cause of universal being. Do you know any of this? No. Can you show that any of this is true? No. <laughs> Can you demonstrate in any way that any of the things you're talking about even exist? In any way? Aside from the imagination of human beings? No? No? Not really. I'm still going to lay down eight points of law on every single subpoint. But no, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. I necessarily, by definition, don't know anything about what I'm talking about. What was that? Uh, he's has perfect dominion over the things produced by him, since in producing them he requires no external agent. How do you know that he requires no external agent? How do you know that he isn't using some other god and drawing his energy from that? You don't know that gods exist. You never, no one's ever shown a god to anyone else. But if this god were drawing his energy from some other source, a god or maybe a fruit stand... Would he tell you? And do you know anything about him, aside from what you think he's told you? <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, I'm not going to interrupt every sentence, I promise. Uh, things which are voluntarily produced by an agent are each ordered to some end. For the good is the end and the object of will. Hence, it is necessary that what proceeds from will is ordered to some end. But by, any, but by anything attains its ultimate end through its action which must be directed to the end by him who gives the thing the principles through which they act. Therefore, it is necessary that God, who is completely perfect in himself and by his power grants existence to all beings, stands as the ruler of all beings and is directed by no one else. Nor is there anything outside his rule, since there is nothing that has, that has not received existence from him. He is therefore perfect in ruling, just as he is perfect in being and causing. Uh... The effect of this rule is differently, is differently manifested in different things according to their different natures. There are some things produced by God that have intelligence and bear his likeness and represent his image. Hence, they are not only directed, but also direct their own actions to their own proper ends. But if, they, if by their own direction they are subject to divine rule, they are able to attain the ultimate end. Uh, but if by their own direction they depart from it, they are expelled. Thinking lack... Things lacking intelligence do not direct themselves to the, to the end, but are directed by another. Some of these are incorruptible, and neither in their natural being nor in their actions ever depart from the orders to the end that has been set, but are unfailingly subject to the first ruler. For example, celestial bodies, whose motion is always uniform. Other, things, other such things are corruptible and can suffer defect in their nature, though this defect can be offset by something arising from it, as the corruption of one for the generation of another, and in their actions, which can deviate from the natural order, though this defect can be compensated for by the good arising from it, from which it is clear that these things do not depart from the order of the first ruler, nor escape his power. These corruptible bodies, having been created by God, are perfectly subject to his power. You've got 800 pages of this in this collected uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. You have 800 pages along those lines. Let's, let's skip ahead. We have uh, 
uh, how easy it would be to let him do as he wished. That is our bookmark. It's by far the most enticing thing in this book. Uh, we'll move ahead here. We'll move on to another section where St. Thomas is uh, expanding on the qualities of angels. In Christian mythos, in Judeo-Christian mythos, angels are divine beings who were with God nearly at the beginning of all that is. He was, uh, they were his first creations that we know of. They are supernatural beings capable of teleportation, telekinesis, destroying cities, uh, vanishing at will, flight. Uh, but they're different, they're, they're different in God's eyes uh, from humans. There is no indication anywhere in, for instance, the New Testament, there is no indication anywhere in the New Testament that Jesus Christ came to save angels. They appear not to need salvation. It, this is, that is a, a compact between God and another set of his creation, humans. Uh, we don't know anything about angels. In the Old and New Testament, they are almost without personality. They are basically messengers. And quite often in Scripture, they are essentially an avatar of God. They, they aren't anything at all except a manifestation of him. Uh, but nevertheless, in the Summa Theologica, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas goes on at great length about angels. So I thought I would read you a little bit of that. This, uh, this is question number 54. <laughs> so there are 53 questions before this one. This is about, he's talking about uh, the knowledge of angels. What is it that angels know and what don't they know? <laughs> Having discussed the substance of the angel, we must go on to his knowledge, which is a four-part consideration. First, we must ask about the cognitive power of the angel. Second, what pertains to his means of knowing? Third, of what things known by him? And fourth, of the mode of his intelligence? The first of these involves five questions. You get those? The first of the four modes involves five questions. Number one, whether the understanding of the angel is identical to that of his substance. Number two, whether his existence and his understanding are the same. Number three, whether his substance is, of, is his knowing power. Are you following this? So the first one was whether he, the understanding of the angel is identical with his substance. But then the second one is whether his existence and his understanding are the same. So is his, is his uh, substance the same as his existence? Number three, whether his substance is, know, is, is his knowing power. Number four, whether the angel has an agent and possible intellect. And number five, whether in the angel there is anything know, any knowing power other than intellect. It seems that it is. The article number one is, is the understanding of the angel identical with his substance? It seems that it is. Do you know anything about what you're talking about? No. Has anyone ever seen, examined what you're talking about? No. Does any of this flabbering hold true for any of the world's billion Hindus? No. No, it does not. No. They say your angels don't exist. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, it seems that it is. The angel is much more sublime and simple than the agent intellect in our soul. Do you know that? No? You're just claiming it? Is there plenty of inference to, that could be drawn to the opposite effect? That maybe beings who are in the presence of the almighty creator of the universe, presumably uh, on your system, the font of all sublimity, is there any argument to be made that if they're in his presence all the time, they might be more sublime than humans, maybe more sublime than humans can detect? Sure, there is. But we're going to go with your way. Uh, but the substance of the angel intellect is its action, as is clear from Aristotle, <laughs> whose book On the Soul, as well as the commentator. Much more so, then, must the substance of the angel be his action than in understanding. Moreover, Aristotle says that in, in metaphysics, this is, he's, the, the samples that he's using here are Aristotle. It, it, pagan Greek author who'd never heard the word angel. Uh, anyway. Uh, that the action of the intellect is life. But since for a living thing to exist is for it to live, it is said in On the Soul, it seems that its essence is life. Therefore, the action of the intellect is the essence of the understanding angel. <laughs> yeah, that, therefore, that just follows A to B to C. Uh, you have, you have uh, did I get the page count right? I just want to, 839 pages of that in here. I know that St. Thomas Aquinas is revered. 
I know that he cited in a million later works, uh, and Penguin made a, cl a classic out of him, and occasionally it is necessary when I am writing about something or other for me to consult. I don't have any kind of uh, original, I don't have a low classical library, I'm not even sure they go up to Aquinas. I don't have anything like that for him, so occasionally it's necessary for me to consult the McInerney translation on my Penguin Classic wall, and so I have this volume because it, would, it, it has come in handy for me and it would also feel wrong to have a whole wall of classics and not have Aquinas. Does that mean that Thomas Aquinas has any worth at all? No, he does not have any worth at all. He is a philosopher. He goes by the name theologian, but it doesn't make any difference at all. No one has ever seen or touched or examined, nor two people seen the same version of sunsetness. <laughs> Plenty of people have seen sunsets, but philosophers talk about sunsetness, the sunsetness of sunsets. And no one has ever seen that. And the only reason they talk about it is so they can write about it in thousand-page books that are contradictory and willfully obscure and tenure-acquiring. Well, okay, <laughs> all right. I don't mean to get, again, I don't mean to get all Monday morning on you, but no one has ever seen gods or angels either. And no two people have the same idea of what they are, and people who don't believe in them are never contradicted by their day-to-day -day reality. If, if you don't believe in sunsets, you will be contradicted by your day-to-day -day reality. But you can go on your whole life not even caring whether or not there is such a thing as sunsetness. And your day-to-day -day reality will never contradict you, because that thing is not real. And so, if you, are, uh, if you are a believing, practicing Christian, it's probably important for you to know at least a pressy of what St. Thomas Aquinas thought and wrote. I would, I can... If pressed, I, would, I could name for you two dozen, three dozen Christian writers, or writers on Christianity who weren't Christian, that are more worth your time to sink into, a little bit, but not the whole. This is, this is not, in other words, a recommend. This is a gigantic work of philosophy. This is not any one particular work. At least it has that. So you can dip in and out of this volume. And again, the McInerney translation is really good. The notes are terrific. Uh, but the writing itself, the work itself, is a complete waste of time. I would, if I could snap my fingers and make it so, I would have the least, the least respected and least enjoyable play by Euripides that we no longer have. One single play. And have the, the pitiless ratio of survival that we talk about in the March of the Penguins all the time. Have it go in favor of, of that one tiny little Euripides play that even he considered a minor work. I'd have it go in favor of that and have it be that in 2020 we're saying, yeah, we know this guy Thomas Aquinas wrote a lot, but we don't have any of it. But I'm not empowered so to snap my fingers. So our Penguin Classic for the week, our Penguin Classic for today, starts the week off on a singularly Monday note <laughs> with a theologian. We're going to try and pick things up tomorrow. <laughs> I will try to pick things up tomorrow. We'll hope for the best. And I'll see you then. Thank you, Booktube.